Blessed Easter to all of you. We're here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, crucified on Calvary, but he did what he promised to do. By the power of God within him, he rose from the dead on that first Easter, and because he lives, we also shall live. It is in the light of the resurrection that we gather, and in the beauty of this sanctuary with the flowers on our gorgeous cross and the flowers that surround this rugged cross, that cross in which you, if you were here Good Friday, you put your sins there with the nail, that in the beauty of this chancel with brass communion wear and, and uh, the, just the beauty of this place, if you look to the slide that's on the wall that Glenn found for me this past week, it is an interesting, striking view, is it not, that was taken in the aspect of the artist from the inside of the tomb. And looking out from the grave that would be ours to see the cross upon which Jesus Christ was crucified, a tomb in which he was laid to rest by Joseph of Arimathea, but he is not here for he is risen as he said. And so in the midst of all the beautiful color of flowers and sanctuary and chancel, here sits this tomb, if you will, today. Thanks to Don Kuyper for hauling the cement blocks from the field in here and building this wall. In my years of ministry, preached a lot of things on Easter morning about a lot of people. But I don't believe in the 37 years that I've been doing this that I ever preached about Joseph of Arimathea. And when we were here in Wednesday night services, going through the Gospel of Matthew, it was striking to me, the three verses that mentioned Joseph, because in the midst of that, it, it states that Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man who had his own garden that was his, he bought it. He was a ruler in the Sanhedrin. He was a respected person within the Jewish community. It says somewhere along the line, he came to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. He voted no. He voted no for crucifixion. And when Jesus was carried out to Calvary 7 and crucified, he was there and went on behalf of the love that he had for his Lord take down his dead body. Wrap it in linens. Carry it to his own grave. To his own grave that he had chiseled for himself in the rock. Do you, you ever think about that? How many of you have pre-planned your funeral and your Raise your hands. How many of you have pre-planned anything? None. Why not? <laughs> right? Why not? Who likes to think about dying? Right? Who likes to think about our own demise and our own death? And yet this Joseph of Arimathea did that. He had this beautiful garden that he used to go to that was his. He bought it because he was wealthy enough to do so. I wonder what went through his mind. I don't know how long it took to dig something like you see on the wall. But here's this powerful, rich, wealthy leader of the Sanhedrin who took time, I don't know what tools he had back then, to start chiseling a spot on a solid rock for but one purpose. To be buried in the hole he was digging. For us, it's like thinking of if I gave you all shovels. And for those of you who maybe have a pre plan, but if you have a cemetery plot here in the area, it's going out there with a the shovel and dig your own hole. So Joseph did. Carved a spot for his dead body to be buried. 
out of his love for his Lord, when Jesus died upon the cross for his own salvation for Joseph, who became a follower of Jesus Christ, he went to Pilate and asked for, instead of begged for the body, Pilate gave it to him. In the Gospel of John, it mentions Nicodemus in this act. You remember Nicodemus. He was also a leader. He was the one that came to Jesus Christ in the, in the protection of darkness to say, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus in the Gospel of John, the third chapter, that Gospel in a nutshell, it says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must, must be lifted up, that all who believe in him will have life everlasting. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not die but have everlasting life, because God sent his Son, Jesus, into the world not to condemn the world, but to save it through him. In my ministry of 36 or 37 years, I've carried two dead bodies of my members who had died in awkward situations due to heart attacks. And I helped family members move those bodies to places that were a little bit more respectful for the deceased. It's hard. It's hard. Carrying a lifeless form from one place to the other. One woman died behind the wheel of her car trying to get herself to the hospital. It was hard trying to be respectful to that deceased body and lift it from the car to the house. It's hard. Joseph's love for his Lord was that great that he carried the lifeless body of the Son of God to a tomb. Not just a tomb. His own. His own that he had worked and chiseled upon, cutting out a spot where someday his own dead body would lay. You see, Joseph never lost sight of the fact, somehow, of his humanity. And as a servant of Jesus Christ and as a child of the living God, he prepared for what was to come. Probably never thinking as he chiseled out a spot to be placed in that he would carry the dead, lifeless body of Jesus Christ and put it in there. And maybe in the midst of all of the gospel lessons, you think, well, it was the Roman soldiers who pushed the stone in front of that grave to protect it, to save it from his disciples for stealing it. No, in those three short verses that we read, Joseph not only claimed the body of Jesus Christ and took it to a tomb, it says he then rolled, maybe with the help of Nicodemus, and maybe there were others with him, but he placed the stone in front of the tomb. The, the Romans simply put a seal on it so that no one could claim that Jesus was alive. It would show if somebody stole his body. The picture on the wall today. Because this really isn't all about Joseph. It's not about us who dig our own graves because of our sin. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I've dug my own tomb. So have you. Not literally, but every single day of my sinful life. There is that wall of separation between myself and my God. And I struggle with it. And I live in it every single day. The same tools that are used to tear down are used sometimes to build up. And the mortar of our sin just keeps occurring over and over and over again. But that's why we've got to look to the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. Why are we here seeking the living among the dead? He is not here, says the angel of God. For he has risen just as he said. I, I wonder... Scriptures don't point to it. I wonder all the work that Joseph went in of chiseling his own grave. 
when he saw and witnessed the risen, living Jesus Christ and believed in him, you would only think that there came a day when Joseph did die, when loved ones wrapped him up and put him in the same grave, the same spot, hewn out of the rock in which he carried the dead body of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But you know what? He did so in thought, knowing that death hasn't won. That because Jesus lives, I don't care where my body's placed. I don't care if you throw my ashes upon Lake Superior, let them float away. Death doesn't win. There is life and resurrection in and through Jesus Christ. Resurrection. Do you live in the resurrection? Right now? I know heaven waits me. And by God's grace, I know heaven waits for every single person on earth who professes and confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in the resurrection. But I believe in it not just for what is to come. We as believers in Jesus Christ need to believe and live in the resurrection now, today. We claim as a church to be alive in Christ, alive in him. It's not just some glorious day, which is there for us, by the way. It's not just in the glorious day that awaits us at our own passing when Family and friends will lay us in a tomb or scatter our ashes wherever we desire them to be scattered. We are alive in Christ now. Doesn't look like a tomb. It looks more like a wall. And if we live in the resurrected Jesus Christ, then we have to take a really serious look at ourselves this day as brothers and sisters in Christ, knowing our sin, knowing our separation between ourselves and God, knowing and believing in the grace and mercy that he bestows upon on Jesus Christ, that walls between us should not exist. That if you're going to live the resurrection, and if I'm going to live the resurrection, then it needs to begin in and through me and in and through you. You've got your walls, so do I. There are walls within our marriages that God intended to be a blessing to ourselves and to others. But because of sin, we start laying the martyr and we start building those things that separate us. And they're powerful separations. And most of the times in sin, we don't want to let them go. There are relationships between brothers and sisters in Christ who get at odds with one another. Maybe it's under the same roof that you've been given with the same people that you love. But walls get built. Don't cheapen the resurrection of Jesus Christ by letting those walls stand. If you believe in the resurrection and Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, then put more effort into it through the grace that God gives to you. As hard as it is, tear down the walls that divide. They have no place in the body of Jesus Christ. Some of you may have read my sermon title for today. It, it came up in the office, to be honest with you, a bit of a joke. My mind goes someplace, and sometimes it shouldn't go there, I guess. The sun, S-O-N. The sun will come out, if you look in your bulletin, tomb, T-O-M-B. 
The sun will come out tomorrow. The sun will come out tomorrow. The Apostle Paul puts it a different way in Galatians 4. When the time had fully come, says Paul, God sent forth his son, born of a woman under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Orphans, here we are, huh? Orphans. But God says to all of you who believe, in my son Jesus Christ, there is resurrection. You are no longer slaves. You are no longer condemned. You are no longer orphans. You are heirs. Heirs of forgiveness. Heirs of mercy. Heirs of grace. Heirs of everlasting life through the death of Jesus Christ. That picture on the wall today is my grave. Whenever it comes, that picture on the wall today is your grave, your tomb. We've dug it through our own sin and separation from God. But the tomb, the grave, ours, is empty because Jesus Christ has conquered our sin, death, and damnation. It's empty. And take a look from the grave at the reminder what God gives to us this day. It's an empty cross, a cross in which Jesus Christ suffered and died, paid the price in agony, but it's a cross that he rose from and says, I'm alive. I'm alive. Think of Joseph. He carved his own grave, dug his own place of burial, carried his dead Lord there only to see him resurrected as he said and gives life. Put me there, God, any time you desire, because death can't win. My brothers and sisters in Christ, the temptation that we have as Christian sinners, the temptation that is there is always in sin to build walls that divide. There is no place for those walls in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Tear them down. Tear them down. He was torn down for us to be able to. He was lifted up that in this day, not just in the day that we enter heaven, but that in this day we rise forth and say, I am alive Jesus Christ, and I will live that gift and resurrection by not letting sin control the relationships that God has given me. Why do you seek the living? Among the dead, he is risen, as he said. Amen.